Welcome to Lesson 15a, One-Dimensional Compressible Flow in Ducts. In this lesson, we'll review the fundamentals of compressible flow. We'll discuss the isentropic flow approximation for an ideal gas. We'll discuss stagnation properties. We'll start to look at one-dimensional compressible flow in a duct. And we'll do some example problems. As a quick review, pretty much everything we've done so far has been incompressible. In other words, density is approximately constant. This is a good approximation for liquid flows and for gas flows at low speed, or better, low Mach number. Now we'll consider gas flows at higher Mach number where compressibility is important. We'll let MA be the Mach number, which is the speed over C, where C is the speed of sound. I point out that many textbooks use A instead of C. A typical rule of thumb is that the flow is reasonably incompressible when the Mach number is less than about 0.3. If you do the math, this comes out to about a 5% change in density. So if this is a tolerable error in density, we can get away with the incompressible approximation. But at Mach numbers greater than about 0.3, we cannot neglect compressibility effects. Consider air at standard ambient temperature, 25 degrees C, Speed of sound turns out to be 346.1 meters per second. So at a Mach number of 0.3, the speed is 0.3 times C, or about 103.8 meters per second. For comparison, most of us drive below 30 meters per second at highway speeds, so the incompressible approximation is definitely okay. Compare that to a Boeing 747, which cruises at about 250 meters per second. The temperature is different at altitude, but the Mach number is about 0.8. So engineers have to take compressibility into account when designing a high-speed aircraft like this. A small plane like a Piper Cub cruises at only about 45 meters per second, so the Mach number is well below 0.3, and flow around these airplanes can be considered incompressible. Let's look at some flow regimes. As we said, at a Mach number below about 0.3, we can consider the flow incompressible. If the Mach number is between about 0.3 but under 1, the flow is subsonic but compressible. Mach numbers near 1 are called transonic, and Mach numbers greater than 1 are supersonic. When dealing with compressible flow, thermodynamics plays a big role. For an ideal gas, such as air, we have the ideal gas law. K is the ratio of specific heats. For air, K is 1.40, and many authors use gamma instead of K. The specific gas constant for an ideal gas is universal gas constant Ru over the molecular weight. It's also equal to Cp minus Cv. And speed of sound is square root of Krt. And be careful that you always express T in Kelvin, not degrees C. In other words, use absolute temperature. Many of our flows can be approximated as isentropic. If you go back to your thermodynamics book, you may recall these relations for an ideal gas. The pressure ratio and the density ratio in terms of temperature ratio and the ratio of specific heats K. These equations apply between any two states 1 and 2 in an isentropic process. This requires no irreversible losses and no heat transfer, in other words adiabatic. These equations also apply to ideal gas flows, which is what we are dealing with here. For example, consider flow from location 1 to location 2 in some kind of a duct. If there's no heat transfer, the flow is adiabatic. And if W dot is 0, there's no work done on or by the control volume inside this duct from 1 to 2. The conservation of energy equation, or the first law, reduces to H naught equal constant, where H naught is the stagnation specific enthalpy. For our control volume, h1 plus 1 half v1 squared equal h2 plus 1 half v2 squared. This equation turns out to be true even if the flow is not isentropic. In other words, you can have friction along these walls. But since the flow is adiabatic, the energy equation reduces to this simplified form. Let's discuss these stagnation properties in a little more detail. For any fluid property f, stagnation property f0 is the value of fluid property f if the flow were brought to rest isentropically. For example, we approximate H as CPT for an ideal gas. So H0 is CP times T0, where T0 is the stagnation temperature. In our adiabatic duct flow, 
H0 is a constant and Cp is a constant for an ideal gas, therefore stagnation temperature is also a constant. We expand H0 and then express H in terms of Cpt and we get this expression. We also have this relationship between Cpk and R, the speed of sound, and the definition of Mach number. Combining these four equations, after a little bit of algebra, we get T0 over T equal 1 plus K minus 1 over 2 MA squared. This turns out to be a very useful equation for us when we're looking at flow in ducts. Note that this holds for an ideal gas. This can be applied at any state in the flow. In other words, at any location in the flow. Here's a summary of isentropic stagnation equations for an ideal gas. We just talked about this one. If we apply our isentropic relations for the pressure ratio and let P2 equal P0 and P1 equal P, we get an expression for stagnation pressure over P, which is this temperature ratio to this exponent. We can do a similar thing with density, with the same result except with a different exponent. This pressure equation in particular is quite useful for duct flows. If Mach number is known and T0 and P0 are known, we can calculate pressure, temperature, and density, etc. at that location in the flow. To give you an idea of how much stagnation temperature rises compared to the static temperature, consider air at 300 K flowing at 100 meters per second. We want to calculate the Mach number and how much T would rise if this flow were brought to rest isentropically. I start by calculating the speed of sound, which is the square root of K, specific gas constant for air, and T, I get about 347 meters per second. The Mach number is thus V over C, which turns out to be 0 0.28803, which is just below what we consider the incompressible limit. From this equation, we can solve for T naught by multiplying the right-hand side by T, which is our answer in variable form, and plugging in the numbers, including the Mach number we just calculated. We get that T naught is 304.98K. To three significant digits, T0 is 305K, and Mach number to three digits is 0 0.288. So compared to our initial 300K, delta T is about 5 degrees C or 5 degrees K. We illustrate that in this picture. If this air is slowed down isentropically, the temperature rises from about 300 to 305K. To solve duct flow problems, we also need conservation of mass. So let's consider conservation of mass for 1D duct flow. Here's a list of our assumptions and approximations. The flow is one-dimensional, in other words, V is approximately uniform across the duct section. This implies that we're ignoring the very thin boundary layer along the walls of this duct. If this is location 1 and this is location 2, average speeds V1 and V2 are all that is necessary to analyze these flows. This is our one-dimensional approximation. We also consider only ideal gases, which in this course will usually be air. The flow is steady, nearly isentropic. Again, we're ignoring friction along the walls and any other irreversibilities. And the flow is adiabatic, which means there's no heat transfer, which allows us to have H0 equal constant and T0 equal constant. Now consider conservation of mass. For this one-dimensional flow, M0 equal rho VA, and this must be a constant. For incompressible flow, we approximate rho as constant, so this equation simplifies to V dot volume flow rate equal VA, which is equal to a constant. So as area goes up, V goes down, and as area goes down, V goes up, as in this sketch. But for compressible flow, it's not so simple, so we have to keep density in our conservation of mass equation. After some algebra, which I won't show here, this equation reduces to dV over V equal 1 over ma squared minus 1 dA over A. We can learn a lot from this little equation. If Mach number is less than 1, in other words the flow is subsonic, then ma squared minus 1 is negative. So dV over V varies like negative dA over A. So if A goes up, V goes down, and if A goes down, V goes up. This agrees with what we're familiar with in incompressible flow. But if Mach number is greater than 1, in other words, supersonic flow, then this term ma squared minus 1 is positive. So dV over V goes like dA over A. 
with no negative sign. So if A goes up, V goes up. And if A goes down, V goes down. So we see there's a fundamental difference between the flow behavior between subsonic and supersonic flow. How can the speed go up if the area goes up? That seems counterintuitive. The answer lies in this equation of conservation of mass. The density is changing rapidly in a supersonic flow. So when the area goes up, the density goes down so fast that V has to go up in order to keep rho VA a constant. Let's compare subsonic and supersonic expansions and contractions. First consider expansions. Flow will always be from left to right. And I'll compare subsonic and supersonic behavior. In both cases, area is going up in this expansion. For subsonic flow, V goes down and Mach number goes down. For supersonic flow, V goes up and Mach number goes up. For subsonic flow, pressure goes up, as we discussed in an earlier lesson regarding subsonic diffusers. But in supersonic flow, the pressure goes down. Density also has opposite behavior. All of these variables behave exactly oppositely comparing subsonic and supersonic flow. For subsonic flow, we call this a subsonic diffuser. For supersonic flow, we call this a supersonic nozzle. Now let's look at a contraction or a converging duct. Again, we compare subsonic and supersonic flows. In both cases, the area goes down. For subsonic flow, V goes up and Mach number goes up but the behavior is opposite for supersonic flow. Similarly, pressure acts oppositely, as does density. The wording is exactly opposite as well. This flow is called a subsonic nozzle or a supersonic diffuser. Let's do an example problem. Air flows through an expanding duct. We give the speed and the temperature at 1 and the temperature at 2, and we're asked to calculate the two Mach numbers and the speed at 2. First, I list my assumptions and approximations. Adiabatic, ideal gas, steady, isentropic, and one-dimensional. We can calculate the speed of sound at location 1. It's the square root of k, r, and t. I get about 395 meters per second. For the given speed, we can now calculate Mach number 1, which is v1 over c1, which to three digits is 1.15, which is supersonic. Since this flow is diverging and the flow is supersonic, Mach number will increase as we go through this diverging duct. We know for this flow T0 is a constant since there's no heat transfer. So we can write our expression for stagnation temperature in terms of T1 and Mach number 1 and in terms of T2 and Mach number 2. We can combine these two equations and solve for Ma2 since T0 is the same in both equations. Leaving out the algebra, I get Mach number 2 is the square root of 2 over k minus 1 times the quantity T1 over T2, 1 plus k minus 1 over 2, Mach number 1 squared, minus 1, close bracket. This is our answer in variables. Plugging in the numbers, 2 over k minus 1, the two temperatures which were given, 1 plus k minus 1 over 2, Mach number 1 squared, minus 1 close bracket. Note that I use several digits here to avoid round off error. I get 1.94773, so Mach number 2 is 1.95 to 3 digits. Finally, we need to calculate V2 from the definition of Mach number. V2 is C2MA2, but C2 is the square root of KRT2, so V2 is the square root of KRT2 times MA2 which is our answer in variables. Plugging in the numbers and using the Mach number we had calculated previously, we get about 653 meters per second. I want to show an alternative method using our stagnation specific enthalpy equation. Since this flow is adiabatic, we break these stagnation specific enthalpies into two parts and apply our ideal gas equation for H on both sides and solve this for V2. So here's our answer for V2 in variables. Plugging in the numbers, we get 652.60, or V2 is 653 meters per second to three digits. Scrolling up, we see that this agrees with our previous calculation. I'm always happy when that happens. Just a final comment. If you can think of different ways to do the same problem, it's a good idea to do it and make sure you get the same answer. 
This boosts your confidence that you are doing the problem correctly. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.